All right, uh, so welcome to the French PowerShell Research Group. Uh, before we start today, uh, I want to let you know that this session is recorded uh, and will be available on YouTube. Um, during the presentation, please, uh, if possible, you, if you can mute your microphone, that would be appreciated so we don't disturb the, the presenter. Uh, however, if you have a questions, feel free to shoot out to him or you can also uh, ask your question inside the chat and we can um, uh, Mickey or myself will will uh, will like the question to the presenter um, uh, what else um, for the French Poetry user group we are also looking for speakers uh, so if you want to present something for us uh, feel free to reach out to me or Mickey or Stefano or Fabien and also uh, outside of the meetings, you can join the Slack chat that we have. I will post the links in the in the chat. And uh, once again, I want to thank uh, Rob Schiffer for taking the time uh, to come here and present for us. So yeah, I give you the the floor. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to present uh, a talk called TDD, which is Test Driven Development with Chef, DSC, and Pester on Windows. I actually gave this talk at the PowerShell DevOps Summit uh, in April this year. Uh, and it was pretty well received and, and uh, was talking to a buddy of mine that's a uh, SQL and PowerShell MVP. And, and he uh, kind of emailed uh, some, some different user groups uh, about uh, potentially giving this, me giving this talk. Uh, virtually, and, and so I was very glad when Mickey uh, e emailed me back and said, hey, you want to come uh, speak for our group? And, and I said, absolutely. So uh, hopefully this is something uh, valuable to you, and, and obviously uh, as we go along, if you have questions, uh, uh, definitely put those in the chat so we can answer those along the way. So just a little bit about me. My name is Rob Schiefer again. Uh, my Twitter handle is Chief7. Uh, that's a great way to contact me later if you have further questions or you're trying out Chef or, or any of these uh, these tools and, and need some help. I also blog uh, very frequently on .netcatch.com, and I blog about .net and Visual Studio and Chef and all kinds of things. Uh, so check that out. I've got lots of posts on Chef if you need more information there. Uh, and then I'm also the co-founder of the Birmingham.net meetup uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, which is in the southeast uh, portion of the United States. Uh, professionally, I've, I've been at uh, EBSCO Industries for about 10 years. EBSCO is the largest uh, reseller of information sales and services uh, in the world. Uh, and so we work uh, very closely with a lot of academic libraries, uh, universities, corporate and government customers to help them find content to put in their libraries for their patrons. Uh, overall, we have somewhere between 500 and 600 developers. Uh, I specifically work in an internal business systems group, and we have uh, several hundred applications and servers, uh, services that we manage. Um, I've been uh, the solution architect for this group for about three years, and uh, while I've been here, one of the, my, my most proud accomplishments is, is to really build up and mature in our continuous delivery practices. Uh, when we first started some of the, the webs, web applications and services we were building three or four years ago, we would only deploy those once every couple of months. Uh, and, and as you can imagine, those were very painful deployments. Uh, lots of code that was being changed, lots of uh, servers that were being touched, uh, and we almost always uh, had issues, and it would take, uh, you know, uh, multiple hours or multiple days even in some cases, uh, and it had downtime for the services, and it was just very, very painful, and it was very stressful time uh, for, for our development teams. Um, and over the last three or four years, we've been investing heavily in our uh, continuous delivery practices, and today we deploy something to production every nine hours. So those hundreds of applications and services, one of those is going to production every nine hours, which is a, a, a very big difference from the way that we used to do things. And uh, much uh, less stress involved, we're able to deploy in the middle of the day, and in the end we've built up a lot of confidence with our business uh, in being able to successfully deploy changes to production. So. Uh, one, one of the ways that we've, we've worked to increase that frequency of deployment 
has been to automate uh, as much as we can. And so the talk today is about that, being able to automate um, your infrastructure configuration. And so we, we do that with a product called Chef. Uh, and Chef is uh, you know what, a tool that you can use to automate that infrastructure configuration. Uh, the alternative uh, uh, has really been, for us at least, manual server configuration. Uh, but there's a lot of problems with that. It's slow. Uh, it's error prone because it's a, a human doing it, and and uh, very likely that they might fat finger something. It's uh, inconsistent, uh, meaning you know if there's many steps to a process, they may perform those steps in slightly different orders or forget to perform a step. Uh, so it, it's inconsistent. Uh, it's just manual, so it's, it, it requires someone's time to go and do that. Uh, oftentimes, someone on an operations team or somebody that's not on your team has to do that. And then it's done in an ad hoc manner, uh, meaning you have to wait for that to occur. And when it's needed, it's usually needed right then. And uh, so there's problems with that as well. Chef, uh, on the other hand, uh, allows us to uh, do things much differently. It's, it's automated, uh, which means it's much faster uh, to, to script that and just run and execute a script is always faster than a, a person performing those steps manually through a, a GUI or through a CLI. Uh, it's more consistent because it is scripted. It's, it, it's performed in exactly the same way every time as long as that, that script hasn't changed. It's repeatable because we can take that script and, and deploy it many times in many different places. It's automated and, and we can schedule it for any time that we, we want to do it. And in fact, you know, the way that we use Chef, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but um, we, we have it actually run every 30 minutes. Uh, so if, if someone goes in and changes part of that configuration and it's out of spec, uh, Chef will automatically run within the next 30 minutes and it'll fix it for us. Uh, so, so really a lot of benefits there to, to automating that and to using Chef. And, and I've also had DSC listed there, which we'll talk about. Uh, and, and so another, so that's, that's kind of generally what Chef is, but uh, I'm really focusing in for this talk on using Chef and building cookbooks in a test-driven development uh, process. And the reason we do that is the same reason you would do that for C-sharp code or, or any other programming language, is that it, it increases the velocity at which that you can build high-quality uh, uh, software, and it produces better designs overall. So uh, we'll, we'll show examples of that, but that's really the, the point of this talk and why we're doing it is, is to a lot of people have heard about Chef and maybe even seen or, or performed some simple uh, cookbooks, uh, but but very few folks I've seen or talked to are actually using uh, the testing involved and, and even more specifically taking a test-driven approach to it. Uh, so that's what we'll look at today. So a little bit more about uh, Chef and what it is. Uh, so it's it's actually built with the Ruby language and it's been around for, for several years now. Um, some of the benefits are it's automated and repeatable server configuration. Uh, it avoids configuration drift. Uh, so over time, when you initially set up some configuration, if you, even if you did it with a script perhaps, um, over time, you know, different individuals may go in and alter that configuration or Windows updates or other automated processes may change that outside of the, the original specifications. Uh, and so that configuration can drift over time. And so Chef can help you maintain that drift and avoid it uh, over time. It also allows us to version our configuration. Uh, so we can check in, uh, and by default, uh, all of your cookbooks are checked in to Git, uh, just a local instance of Git, and that obviously you can uh, distribute that up to a, a, a remote or, or shared instance in the cloud. Uh, and then it's testable, uh, again, like what we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, there are several different components, major components of Chef. Uh, so you have the Chef server, which is a centralized uh, service uh, that, can, that you can use to manage how your Chef cookbooks are applied and to, to provide some administrative functions uh, in regard to Chef. We have the Chef client itself, which is the, uh, the executable that runs on the nodes that, that are being uh, automated. And then uh, finally, uh, you run cookbooks inside of uh, that Chef client uh, against your node. And that cookbook can have one or more recipes as well. So those are some of the components we'll talk about. Uh, so actually, let me go back. So th there's a pictorial or an image that, that shows that here. Uh, the <clears throat> cookbooks and, and recipes are built on a workstation using the Chef DK. We'll look at that. 
Uh, the chef server is the thing that uh, applies those, and then you have the chef clients with all the nodes. So looking at the chef DK, which is where our workstation is, uh, there's a couple of components there that chef provides for you out of the box. Chef DK is the, the name that they give their development toolkit. Um, and some of the components there are food critic. Uh, that's the tool that they uh, provide for static analysis of chef cookbooks and Ruby. Uh, there's Kitchen, which, which is a, a test execution engine, uh, which we'll look at today. There's Chef Spec, uh, which is a unit testing framework for Chef. Uh, we have InSpec. InSpec is a more of an integration uh, testing tool that, that allows you to test policies and, and define policies for your nodes. And then you have the actual cookbooks and recipes as well that, that you would build. Then in the Chef server, uh, it can uh, provide a registry of, of cookbooks uh, that, uh, that can be applied to the nodes. It provides a data store where you can put attributes for different servers and roles and things. Uh, it has some searching capabilities and, and pr can provide high availability uh, to, to uh, consumers of the, the server. Uh, it has an API that you can use to automate uh, certain portions of Chef. It has a supermarket, which makes uh, cookbooks available to other consumers. Uh, and then you can define run lists and policies and things uh, and manage those in a, uh, a more enterprise or, or large scale way that makes it much easier to use. And then finally, you have uh, the nodes that you would actually run sh the chef client on. And, and those are the nodes that you would automate the configuration of. Uh, so next, uh, we'll, we'll talk about Chef in the context of Windows. So originally, Chef was uh, built to, to work with Linux, um, and they, they had a lot of success there, and then they, they kind of slowly started to build up the Windows support. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Microsoft and PowerShell were building some of the same type of functionality as well, specifically PowerShell DSC. Uh, and so it came came along later uh, after Chef had been around for a while and kind of established themselves as a major player in the server configuration space or infrastructure configuration space. Uh, and uh, but but what was neat was Chef added support for DSC. Uh, so so much like Chef has resources that you can use in a recipe, DSC provides resources as well that you can use. Uh, which are kind of the tools that, that you would use to automate certain types of configuration. Uh, but Chef added support with that. They created a DSC, resources, uh, DSC resource by which you can execute DSC resources. Uh, so we'll, we'll take a look at that. Uh, but beyond that, uh, you know, a lot of folks ask, well, if, if Microsoft has DSC and we're really a Microsoft shop or we're using Windows primarily, why wouldn't we just uh, use DSC directly? And uh, Chef Server is a component that um, DSC really doesn't have a, a, an alternative to. And it provides some additional features that are very useful beyond DSC. Things like reporting and roles and environment management, uh, a whole administrative uh, web interface and API, and then uh, 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 a data store of attributes that, that you can use against uh, or for roles and environment. So there's, de there's definitely some benefits there. Overall, Chef is just more mature. Uh, they've been around longer. Uh, they, they work with multiple platforms now with Linux, Mac, and, and Windows. And so um, they just have more features, obviously, uh, than, than DSC has at this point. So really, a lot of what I'll talk about today is kind of a marriage between uh, Chef and PowerShell DSC and PowerShell uh, and, and why that's useful. So that's just kind of a general overview of uh, chef and uh, Chef and Windows and cookbooks. Any questions before we look at an example of a cookbook and look at some code? Uh, someone was just curious on how many Chef server you are running in your company. Yeah, it's a great question. So right now, uh, actually, we've only been doing Chef development in my group for about six months. Uh, at EBSCO, we've had some folks that have been doing it a bit longer. Uh, but right now, we're just running a, a single Chef server. Uh, and we're, we have uh, just a half a dozen servers that we're managing right now. So we're really not using it the high scale that it's capable of at this point. Uh, but we're able to get a lot of value out of just a single Chef server uh, at this point. All right. And if there is another question also regarding HA, but I think someone answered already. They were asking, like, if a Chef 
uh, as a feature, you know, as a high availability? Yes, it, right. it does. Absolutely. There's there are certain features that are uh, paid for, I believe. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think all of the server features are necessarily free. Uh, but they definitely give you a lot of functionality for free out of the box. All of, Sh all of I think all of Chef, or, or nearly all, is open source. Uh, so you can look at and use the, the code there. Uh, but I believe there's a few enterprise features uh, that uh, do cost. And, and, and it may just be the support. Honestly, I haven't even looked at it. But for what we're doing, uh, we're not requiring a, a Chef license at this point or anything. Uh, but uh, there, there's a lot that you can get for free. All right. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So let's let's take a look at a Chef cookbook. So I'm going to use Visual Studio Code uh, to to look around here. And so what we're looking at here is the Explore view, where you can see a, a folder uh, that I've created here. And so I've got a cookbooks folder, and within that cookbooks folder, I've got several cookbooks that uh, I'm utilizing here. This Acme Win Web is a custom cookbook that I created. And these others are dependencies uh, of my cookbook. So I'm specifically, I have a dependency on the PowerShell cookbook. It, in turn, has dependencies on some of these other ones. And I've just downloaded all of those locally uh, so that I don't have to go out to the web every time and, and pull them down and download them. So if we look at this, uh, Acme Win Web, this is my custom cookbook. And uh, there's a simple uh, chef command. I think it's chef cookbook create. And that will create this basic structure, this folder and file structure for you, uh, um, and, and allow you get, to get started very easily. There's there's tons of documentation on the Chef uh, website to help get you going very quickly. I would definitely suggest uh, to to go out and review those if if you have an interest in getting started. Uh, but we'll we'll look at some of this today. And so the first thing we'll look at is this metadata file. And so here, this just gives you some general information about your cookbook. Uh, things like the name of the cookbook, who's maintaining it, an email address, what type of license, a description. Uh, and then it's very important to have a version for your cookbook so that over time you can publish new, new versions of the cookbook and allow folks to choose what versions they wish to use. Uh, further, I have the dependency uh, on the, the PowerShell cookbook that I'm defining here. Uh, so that's basically it. Not a lot there, but uh, definitely uh, something that you need to know about. Uh, regarding this dependency, uh, Chef also has a dependency manager called Burkshelf. And we can look at the configuration of Burkshelf in this Burks file. Uh, and so here you can see I've got a, a default source of the uh, public Chef supermarket. And so that's where uh, there's hundreds or thousands of, of publicly available Chef cookbooks that you can use. Some that have been developed by Chef and some that have been developed uh, externally or by third parties. And so you can definitely use those in your development of your cookbooks uh, to tie together multiple cookbooks and define an overall uh, configuration for your uh, servers that you want to configure. And then further, there's this directive uh, of metadata. And that instructs Burkshelf to look at the metadata file for any dependencies that I've defined, like for this PowerShell one. When I run Chef, it'll look at the Burks file and then in turn at the metadata file and then pull down all of the dependent cookbooks that I need. So that's very handy. Next, we'll look at the, the library or the recipe itself. So you get this default recipe uh, by default when you create a cookbook. And I think, um, I don't know that it actually has, it may have like a, a default log uh, that it gives you with the Chef Create command. Uh, but then it's it's that's usually just about it. I've added quite a bit here uh, that we'll take a look at today. So just first off, if you need to log something in the context of your Chef run, that's very easy to do. Uh, you can do that with a Chef log debug or Chef log warn. There's different commands you can use there. In this case, I'm just uh, deb uh, writing out the NT version that I'm currently running this Chef cookbook against. So uh, there's a helper method here that I can use to get the NT version. And then I can convert that to a string and write it out in my debug statement. Uh, let's skip down just a little bit and take a look at uh, this resource. So this is a directory resource from Chef. And this is a resource that we can use to create or delete uh, directories. So here I'm, I'm uh, referencing the directory resource. I'm, I'm giving the, this instance of the resource a name of just log folder. And then I have the block of code here that further defines how I want to use that resource. So my action 
uh, is to, to create, I want to create this directory, and then I'm setting the path to log folder, which is just a variable that I've defined right above uh, for C logs. And so that's all I need to do to instruct uh, the cookbook and chef to create a log folder on the target node. Uh, so pretty simple. And so there's all kinds of resources that you can use, uh, things to um, create uh, a registry entry on Windows, for example, or to, um, uh, let's see, there's others down here, all kinds of things. You can look at Chef, uh, we, let's, let's just go look at that real quick. So they've got really great documentation uh, on the Chef website and a whole host of resources that they provide out of the box. Um, that, that you can utilize. So here's the documentation for the directory uh, resource, and you can look here, there's all kinds, you can run bash scripts uh, on Linux, and uh, you can set up uh, ACLs, you can uh, run cron jobs, you can deploy things, uh, you can create environment and variables, you can create files, uh, you can run git commands, um, you can mount things. There, there's all kinds of things that you can do here. We're all very useful uh, for, for building those things up and, and things that Chef provides out of the box that you can utilize uh, without having to rewrite all of that or script that manually. Uh, so we'll, we'll go back to the top here now and, and look at include recipe. So this is a way that we can use dependencies uh, that we've set up. In this case, I'm, I'm referencing the PowerShell cookbook and then specifying that I want to run the PowerShell 5 recipe from that cookbook. But there's a conditional here that I only want to do that if it's not Windows 10. So Windows 10 comes with PowerShell 5 by default, so I don't need to run it in, in that case. And uh, this is just a variable that I've defined here, again, using another helper method for getting that NT version and then evaluating is that less than 10. And so that I can, I'll, you'll see I can use that below here, but this is really great uh, in that I don't have to write a bunch of scripting to install PowerShell. I'm just leveraging this publicly available cookbook. So again, another great way to, to use the power of the Chef community and the Chef platform uh, and, and to make your cookbook development much easier. So let's look down here. There's another conditional statement where, uh, and I'll just uncomment this. The reason I have this commented is right now it, um, it's, going, it's trying to download something and, and my demo is based on not requiring an internet connection just to make it simpler and, and a little bit quicker. So uh, but I'll uncomment it for this uh, description here. So if what, what I want to do is I want to have two different ways of inst uh, creating a, a file share in Windows. If it's not Windows 10, uh, I, I can't use uh, some of the, the cooler PowerShell commandlets that are available there. So instead I have to use some scripting, some command, uh, some uh, batch commands, uh, specifically the net share command. Uh, to create that, and I've got to script that out uh, to, to do that. In this case, I, I want to use PowerShell uh, to do that and get some of the benefits of PowerShell scripting just because I'm more familiar with PowerShell, and it's a little bit more um, uh, powerful than just regular batch scripts. I could, I could just run a script, a bash script, or batch script uh, as well, but I, I chose to use PowerShell here. So if you want to use PowerShell, you can leverage the DSC resource and tell it you're running a resource of script. Uh, and in that case, I've got to provide three different scripts, just like you would do with DSC. One to provide a description of what that DSC resource does, one to test to see if that resource needs to be executed, and then finally one to uh, actually perform uh, the environment that I want to do, or, or perform the, the, the configuration that I want to do. So in this case, my test script is, is calling the net share batch uh, command uh, to see if a log share already exists. And if it, doesn't, uh, if it doesn't return an error record, that means it already exists and I don't have to apply this configuration. If it uh, doesn't exist, it will throw that error. And here I'm up in the top on the set script, I'm gonna again run the net, net command with the args that I've defined here. So I, I want to tell it I want to run the share um, command on net, and then I want to uh, pass it the logs name for the, the uh, file share, and then give it the path that I want to use uh, for that file share. And again, I'm reusing this variable that I created here at the top. 
So that's kind of clunky uh, for for uh, nodes that aren't Windows 10. How would we do that if it is a Windows 10 uh, in uh, node? Uh, it, it becomes much simpler and much easier to read at that point. So in this case, I want to actually leverage an actual DSC resource here. Uh, but first, I've got to download that resource. So first, I'll, I'll run the DSC <coughs> resource script resource. And I just need to install the DSC resource named XSMB Share. That DSC resource is a resource that's available on the PowerShell gallery. And we can download that for free um, by, by using this install module. And I can test whether that already exists by using the git DSC resource command. This is a, a commandlet that is only available on PowerShell 5. Uh, so again, that's why we can only do this on uh, Windows 10 or Server 2016. <clears throat> Once we've downloaded and installed that DSC resource, now I can leverage that again using the chef DSC resource and then specifying I want to use the XSMB share DSC resource. Uh, behind the scenes, this DSC resource is actually using the get SMB share commandlets instead of commandlets, uh, again, which are only available on Windows 10 or Server 2016, and so that's why I can only use that on Windows 10. But you can see here, it's much easier to read and to set up. Uh, I have to give it a name. And so again, I'm giving it logs. I give it the path, which I'm using this variable again for. Uh, I set up the read access for the guest account. Uh, and then I just want to say ensure present to, to make sure that configuration is applied. So this is an example of, of being able to use a DSC resource versus not being able to use uh, a native DSC resource. Uh, don't be confused. Here, I'm really just I'm using this DSC resource to run some PowerShell script. Uh, so, but you can see that the 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 scripting is is much harder to read and understand and grok right off as opposed to using a native DSC resource. In this case, the XSMB share. Uh, so, uh, sh this is just an example of two ways of doing that. So, this is a, a little bit more uh, complex of an example. But let's look at uh, the directory. So in this case, we use the chef resource that's available, but we can do that with the DSC resource as well. So in this case, I'm using the file DSC resource and giving it the destination path. Uh, this is a, for a data folder instead of a log folder this time. Uh, and uh, I'm giving it a type of directory. So this is an example of creating a directory using a DSC resource called file instead of using the chef resource. So in this, in this case, it's not quite as clear cut. I guess technically there's one more line here to specify that it's a directory that we want to create. So slightly more verbose, uh, but, but still very similar. Uh, I would say it's, it's much, um, much more uh, similar than, than maybe this, this example where this scripting is hard to understand and you've got to get all of this encoding uh, correct to, to insert uh, variables and things. I think this is a pretty clear example that DSC is absolutely better in this case. In this case, you know, it's it's uh, fairly equivalent. Uh, and so, you know, some people ask, well, do you always use DSC resources when they're available, or do you sometimes use Chef resources? And and I really take a pragmatic approach, and just say, and use whatever makes the most sense for you. If you're more familiar with PowerShell or uh, you, you have a desire to use more PowerShell, use the DSC resource. Uh, there, there are probably are some cases where using the DSC resources uh, are harder uh, than using the Chef resources. Uh, so you just got to look at the scenario and, and think through uh, which, which makes the most sense. Uh, so with that said, I think that fairly well covers uh, kind of the, the, the intro to a, a recipe and utilizing chef resources. Um, before we move on to the next topic, is there any questions on any of this? Uh, so far, so good. Okay, great. So the next thing we want to talk about is, is unit testing. So we've talked through kind of just the general way that you create chef uh, cookbooks and, and recipes, uh, but now we want to do that in a uh, using tests. Uh, and so, uh, Chef provides a couple of different tools for that. The first one we'll look at is called Chef Spec, and we mentioned that earlier. Uh, Chef Spec is the te uh, unit testing framework that's provided with Chef. And, and specifically, it kind of builds on top of RSpec. 
RSpec is a Ruby tool for running unit tests. And because Chef is written in Ruby, uh, it utilizes RSpec. And just Chef spec really does two things. It provides a sandbox in which you can run your unit tests. And then secondly, it provides a bunch of helpers uh, and things for, for you to write your unit tests easier on top of RSpec. Uh, so, uh, again, it, it evaluates those cookbooks and recipes inside of the chef spec sandbox. So it's not actually applying the cookbook that you're testing to a, a real node or a virtual machine or anything. It's only running it inside of that sandbox, and then it's evaluating how that's running to determine if, um, if it's running correctly in the context of your chef spec unit tests. Um, whoops. So the Chef client itself is not fully being executed in a real environment. Uh, it's all running inside of that, that sandbox. Uh, but that still provides you quite a bit of value. It, it, it allows you to validate the syntax uh, for both your Ruby code and your Chef code. Uh, it helps you to verify logic within your recipe. Uh, it can help you verify guards, which are uh, conditionals, uh, just like we, very similar to what we saw with the if not in the, in the code. Uh, a little bit earlier. So this is a, a type of guard uh, where we can say only do this if some condition is true. And there's there's some lot there, there's a syntax that you can do that inside of the, the recipe as well or inside of the resource. Uh, and then there's expectations and properties that you can set and, and unit test as well within the resource. Uh, each uh, unit test is re reevaluates the cookbook uh, by default. Uh, so that you don't have any kind of shared state that, that's maybe affecting other tests. Uh, but you can, that, that slows it down slightly, but there are ways to, to cache that and only do it once and then apply it to multiple uh, unit tests if you, if you have that need. Uh, and then Burke Shelf is utilized uh, for all the dependency management. Even though it's not running uh, and fully executing the Chef client, even within the sandbox, it still has to uh, fulfill those dependencies and set those up. So let's look at an example of how to do that in code. So if I come back to my uh, cookbook here, I can look and there's a, a spec folder. And within the spec folder, there's a unit folder and then a recipes folder. And then I have my actual um, uh, unit test here. I'm gonna go back real quick and uncomment that again, or recomment that. All right. So this is uh, our unit test file, it's, it's a, uh, the, the convention that we use here is the recipe name underscore spec dot RB. Uh, and so that's, that's what the chef spec um, framework will, will look for when we go to run our tests. Uh, and so here at the, the very top, we have some dependencies on some outside libraries. This first one is a, a spec helper file that we've defined uh, also in, in our folder structure. And within that, it's referencing some libraries that are provided by Chef by default. Uh, so Chef Spec and Chef Spec Workshelf for the two that we're using here. Uh, the Spec Helper is nice if you have multiple unit test files. You can put all of your shared dependencies here once uh, and manage them here, and then just simply reference that uh, with the require Spec Helper. So it helps to remove some redundancy uh, in, in all of all the setup for your unit tests. Secondly, I've got a, a require relative, which is referencing uh, a library that I created. Uh, you can do that as well. We won't really look at that today, but just something uh, to know uh, that, that you have available. Uh, and next, we get down to the actual unit test, and we'll start at this describe block. And so this is a part of our spec where you start to describe the context of your unit test. So in this case, uh, the, the general convention is to reference your cookbook first. And then the recipe, so in this case, it's the Acme WinWeb cookbook, and I want to test the default recipe. And then I have a further context block, which is really just a subgrouping of the unit test. And in this case, I'm saying I want to run this recipe uh, on a Windows version, and it's referencing this variable. And, and we've defined the variable in the loop above the describe where we've got an array of different Windows versions that we want to run the Chef Cookbook against in the context of Chef Spec. And it's, this is really just a loop statement. And we're saying for each of these uh, versions in this array, we want to create a, a version uh, property and then run all of the, everything below it. Uh, and then we reference that in a couple of different places. First of all, in this context, so we're going to run all of our unit tests 
on different versions of Windows. Uh, you have some before statement here. We're really not re going to look at that too deeply, but this is just setting up some some mocking, basically, uh, where anytime this website uh, website bindings um, object is uh, referenced, uh, it, it returns uh, s something some some uh, mocked up value, some test value. Uh, so so know that you can do mocking. That's really beyond the, the scope of this talk, but know that that's there and available to you. Uh, then we, we actually use that version variable again when we do the setup for the chef run. So this let is a, a command where we can create the chef run object kind of almost as a um, uh, anonymous function of sorts. So it's, it's deferring and, and doing lazy execution of this code. Uh, but within here, we're creating a runner, which is using the chef spec solo runner and defining that we want to run the Windows platform and a specific version, either 2008R2 or Windows 10, depending on where we are in the loop. Uh, and then we want to call converge. So converge is the step where the cookbook is applied in, in the context of this cookbook run against the chef spec solo runner. And so this is, this, is the, this is basically setting up that sandbox, that chef spec sandbox that we talked about. And putting all of that into a deferred, uh, execution uh, variable uh, and then we just do a little bit more setup and we we define a variable for our cookbook name uh, so that we can reference that uh, further down in our unit test finally we get down to an actual unit test here so to define a unit test you use the it uh, syntax uh, and and create a, a, a block here which didn't mean to do that and so this first test is just setting up an expectation against our chef run uh, so this means it's going to run this code, and then we want to validate or, or uh, validate an expectation that it should not, this chef run should not raise an error. Uh, so that's, I think, the default unit test that you get with a chef create uh, cookbook. Uh, and so next we want to do one that's a little bit more specific to our, uh, our cookbook and our recipe. So similarly, we use an it block. We give the test a name. So we want to name it creates a log directory. Uh, and then we create a new ex, uh, expectation for the chef run that we expect it to create a directory uh, and we, we expect that resource to be named log folder and that that resource should have some properties specifically that the path should be set to C logs. Now this, this is what they call a, a chef spec uh, resource matcher. Uh, and so the, the convention is this is the resource uh, name and this is the action name. So we expect that the directory resource uh, should should use the create action, and we want that to be that expectation to also validate that it has properties. So with a path of C logs. So if we compare that to our uh, resource here, uh, we it's a directory resource. It's calling the create action. It's named log folder, and it's passing the path of log folder, which is C log. So you can see everything kind of checks out there, uh, and uh, it, it, we're validating and unit testing uh, that that resource is being executed in the way that we would expect. Uh, similarly, uh, we can do some uh, further work here uh, that we expect the, um, the chef run to run a DSC resource to create the log share um, with uh, these properties. So again, this all matches up to the code that we have here as well. So, but how do we actually run these unit tests? So to that, we'll, uh, we'll go to the command prompt. Uh, I'm in a PowerShell uh, command prompt here, but we can leverage the Chef DK uh, to do that. So uh, the Chef DK, not only does it include all the Chef libraries and things, but it also includes other dependencies of Chef like Ruby and git. Uh, and so we can leverage those by using the chef uh, exec command. And in this case, we want to call rspec. Uh, so this is going to use the embedded Ruby instance with the chef DK. Uh, it's going to look in my current folder, which is my Acme WinWeb fol folder, and look for rspec or chef spec tests to run. And so that's what it's doing now. It's looking at the folder structure, and it's found that. And now it's executing chef spec it created the chef spec sandbox and then it ran all of my unit tests there. And you can see it took about 16 seconds or so to run that. 
and I, it ran 12 examples with zero failures. Uh, so that's that's an example of a a passing uh, run. But now let's let's change something. So if I decide later I want to call this C logs two, and I save that, I can rerun our spec, and it's going to to create my chef spec sandbox. It's going to take my cookbook and run it inside of the, that that sandbox, evaluate how it runs, and then compare that uh, against the expectations that I've defined in my unit tests. So here again, it's it's done all that and now it's starting to evaluate those unit tests and you can see this time I've got some errors. Uh, you can see it, it ran 12 examples again but this time it had uh, three failures. And so if we look at this, first of all that first unit test failed that expected not to have any um, uh, any errors. Uh, so here you can see that the error was thrown on that directory logs folder. You can see that we also had the create logs, uh, uh, this unit test that's actually being run against 2008R2 where we're expecting it to create a log share. And it gives us some further details about you know, what, what didn't happen quite right. Uh, so it did see that uh, it expected this uh, resource to run and it did find that, but it's saying, hey, your set script was different. We were expecting it to run against C logs, but it actually ran against C logs too, where that's the directory that it created. So that's the difference that it found and, and the cause of the error. Further, it also ran that against Windows 10, and the, the same error occurred, and you can see uh, that it expected that, but it, it never ran. That the path it expecting was C logs, but it was uh, actually C logs too. Uh, so there, that's just an example. If we go back and undo that change and rerun our tests, everything will be successful again. So this is an example of building a unit test, executing that unit test, having a successful unit test run, and then a failing, failing unit test run. Any questions about unit testing with Chef? Um, there's one related to uh, does Chef take care of DSC modules deployment, or do you still need to take care of that into account? A great question. Yep. So you you have to handle that. Uh, so if we go uh, to the, the recipe here, you can see in this case I'm having to install uh, the the XSMB share DSC resource. So anything that's not uh, built into PowerShell itself, any DSE resources that aren't built in, you have to manage installing those. Uh, and there's different DSE resources that you can use to do that. Uh, but in this case, I did have to install that module from the PowerShell gallery. Now, that being said, I did not have to do that for the, um, the file DSE resource, because that's available and in, in installed with PowerShell 5. Uh, and so uh, that that wasn't a concern. And so I am I do have to uh, validate that PowerShell 5 is installed, so that I can make sure I can use that in uh, the versions of Windows that I'm I'm using. All right, great thanks. question. Yeah, there is no other questions so far. Great. So that that covers unit testing. Uh, so next up, we've got integration testing. So this is where we we start to use Kitchen. Uh, Kitchen is that integration testing engine that's that comes with Chef, uh, and there, there's a couple of steps to that. Uh, so in this case, uh, Kitchen is actually running the cookbook against a virtual machine, uh, and so it goes through all of the steps of running the Chef client, and Kitchen just basically manages all that for you. And so these are the steps that you can utilize uh, or that are performed as part of that Kitchen test run. So first it has to create the VM. Uh, and that's where it, it interacts with some type of a virtual machine uh, driver and uh, or a prov provisioner, I think is what it calls it. And so there's many of those, and, and by default, uh, I think it sets it up to use Vagrant, which is a, a fairly well-known uh, virtual machine uh, manager. They have what are called Vagrant boxes, and they have a whole registry of Vagrant bo boxes. It's really easy to use Vagrant, very good. Uh, in this case, I'm using Hyper-V as my provisioner because I'm running on Windows, uh, and I already have that installed. I don't have to means I don't have to install VirtualBox and Vagrant and all those other dependencies. And hopefully, uh, because I have fewer dependencies, uh, I, I have a more reliable workstation. Uh, but there's many other provisioners. You can use OpenStack or Azure or AWS. There's lots of different provisioners you can use. Uh, 
Again, there's the converge step, which we saw in, in the context of chef spec. We also have that in kitchen, and that's where the cookbook is applied to the VM that was created. And then finally, uh, we have the verify step, which is where we take our integration tests and run that against the virtual machine to validate that the cookbook configured the node appropriately. And there's different uh, uh, verifiers that you can use uh, to, uh, to run your integration tests. InSpec is the one that comes with uh, Chef by default. Uh, and so you can do that within Ruby. Um, Pester is a PowerShell uh, testing uh, framework. We can utilize that. That's what we're using in this example, in this demo. Uh, and then finally, Server Spec is a Ruby-based um, option uh, that you can utilize as well. Uh, let's see. And then finally, you know, you if, if you want to go through all those steps again, you need to destroy your environment and start over. So you can use the destroy command for that. So we'll, we'll see each of these steps uh, in the process. All right, so let's look at uh, some code again. So again, let's go to the cookbook folder. And this time I want to look at the test folder. And within test, I have integration. And then I have my cookbook dot uh, recipe name and then a pester folder, and then I have a, a, a PowerShell file here that defines my pester tests. So if you're familiar with pester, it's, it's, it's standard pester syntax. There's not really anything uh, specific about Chef here. Uh, and this is where we can define how we want to validate uh, that our configuration was um, uh, successful. So here, uh, very similar to our spec, we have a describe block where we describe the name of our test and what we're testing. And then we have these it blocks that define the actual integration tests themselves. Uh, I have a name for my integration test, and then I have the PowerShell code to validate. So in this case, I'm just using the test path commandlet uh, to validate that the C data folder was created. Uh, so test path should return true. Doing the same thing for the logs folder, and then uh, here again in the um, uh, uh, SMB share, the file share example, I'm using some different um, options here uh, to do that as well. So I'm, if it's not Windows 10, I don't have the git SMB share commandlets. Uh, and so I have to use these uh, batch commands instead. Again, I'm using net share and evaluating that the response contains um, you know, some expected output. Uh, and, and then I'll, so that's, that's actually validating the read access is, is correct, uh, where this command is just calling net share and then the, fault, the, fair, the um, file name or, or the, the share name. So folder name is, uh, that's file or the share folder name. Uh, and, and we're expecting that not to be null. Uh, if I'm running on Windows 10, however, and again, I'm just checking if it's Windows 10 by using the PowerShell um, environment uh, helper method there, uh, I can use the git smb share because it's Windows 10, which is a commandlet that's available in, in later versions of Windows. Uh, and if it returns logs, then uh, it's not null and, and it was created successfully. Further, I can use the git smb share access commandlet to validate that the uh, access is all set up correctly as well. So just standard pester files there. Uh, and then when I'm ready to um, use kitchen, uh, there's a few different commands that I'll use. So first off, um, well, actually, let's, let's look at the setup for that first. So we, we looked at the pester test, but how do we configure kitchen? Uh, so there's a, a configuration file called uh, kitchen.yaml. And uh, that's a, a YAML configuration file that defines how we want Kitchen to run. And so it's really just setting up all of the configuration that we talked through on the different steps. First, we have a driver uh, where we define how we want um, the, the VM created. Uh, as we discussed, I'm using Hyper-V. And then I've got to give it some details about how I want Hyper-V to actually create uh, that virtual machine. So I have to tell it what VM switch to use, what VHD folder name, what uh, VHD name, and then some credentials here. And then also how much memory to, to give it. Further, I have to set up a transport. In this case, I'm testing against Windows. Uh, so I want to use uh, WinRM with, with these credentials. Uh, this is all uh, test uh, in the context of testing. So these are all just sample users. So there's really no 
uh, issue with or concerns around uh, username passwords in, in this case. Uh, then we, we have our provisioner. Uh, and so this is what we use to actually perform the converge. And there are a few different provisioners. In general, uh, you'll probably just uh, use the chef server. There's only one instance I can think of uh, where I used to use a different provisioner, and I don't do that anymore. So I think going forward, uh, I would only expect to use the chef zero provisioner. Uh, and then I have to give it a path to the uh, chef client. So one of the things that the converge step does, that the provisioner does, is it installs chef if it doesn't already exist on the node. And in this case, I'm telling it explicitly, I want to use a particular version of the chef client, and I want to pull it from a, a, a place. I'm, this is a cached version that I have locally, again, so that I don't have to rely on an internet connection. Then I specify that the fire, the verifier uh, for my integration test is Pester. And so all of this is the default uh, configuration uh, up here. Uh, but then I can override that with some uh, overrides for specific platforms. And in this case, I want to actually run my integration test against three different platforms on Nano, on Windows Server 2016, and Windows uh, Server 2008 R2008 R2. In each case, I have to use some, some different um, information here. I have to override some of these settings from above. Um, in this case, I have a particular version of the Chef client that I want to use. In, in the case of Nano, I can't use MSI, so they're not supported in MSI uh, in Nano anymore. So I have to use an AppX package that I've uh, also cached. Uh, for Windows Server 2016, I want to use a different uh, virtual machine, a different VHD in, in, um, in Hyper-V. And again, in 2008R2, again, I want to use a different VHD to, that, that has 2008R2 installed, obviously. And then lastly, I define the suites that I want to run. I have to give it a name, which the convention is um, the um, cookbook and the recipe. And then I specify um, the, the actual cookbook list and recipe list that I want to run. This is the run list, just like you would define in Chef Server. So that's the configuration for Kitchen. Now to execute that, you, there, there are different commands. So I can call Kitchen Create Nano. Uh, and so that means I want to specifically run Kitchen for the Nano uh, um, platform. So that means it's going to only run this part. Um, obviously, you, you could just run uh, Kitchen Create, and it would create all of those platforms and run the test against all of those, but that takes a lot more time. So in this case, I, I want to run uh, Nano. So actually, I've already got, uh, I've already created this prior to the demo. So if I say Kitchen List, it'll give me the list, it'll read the kitchen.yaml file and show me the list of uh, the different uh, Kitchen instances that I have. So you can see I have Nano. Windows Server 2016 and Windows Server 2008 R2. If I look at last action, I can see that I've already verified Nano, but the others I haven't created yet. So that can give you a quick view of what you have and, and what you've already used. Uh, in this case, I'm going to uh, destroy that and just start uh, fresh so that you can see uh, how that, that's all performed. So now uh, if I run kitchen list, again, it's not going to have anything there. I do have to go in and delete some, uh, some old logs and things. Uh, well, it may, let's see. There we go. Uh, so now you can see the kitchen list. It says nano is not created, so we can create it explicitly now. I'm calling kitchen create nano, and I'll pull up Hyper-V, and you can see I don't have any virtual machines uh, as of yet, uh, but you can see in the background here that it's actually uh, going through the steps of interacting with Hyper-V and uh, talking to Hyper-V to create that. You can see it's creating it here and it's going through the steps of uh, creating that uh, Hyper-V virtual machine. And so it takes, um, I think, about 30 seconds to do that. Uh, you can see it's running now. It has networking set up. Uh, you can see it's using three gigs of, of RAM like we instructed it to, and it's healthy and everything's uh, good. It's running, it's using very little CPU at this point. Uh, so this will finish up, and it took about 40 seconds to do that. The next step, like we talked about, is to call Kitchen Converge. 
And again, we're going to do that on the Nano instance. And so this is where it's going, again, to connect to that Hyper-V image, and you'll see the CPU usage start to spike as it's interacting. But it's, it's going through and looking for the cookbook dependencies using Bookshelf. Uh, it's uploading those uh, to the target, and it's installing the Chef client. So it's downloading the AppX um, Chef client package. It's installing Chef. That's what it's doing here. That'll take uh, several seconds. And uh, once it, it completes that, it'll finish the upload of all of my custom cookbooks and my reference cookbooks to the node and apply those to, to that instance. So that, this will take just a minute or two. While that's happening, any questions uh, about kitchen or the pester test or any of that while we're waiting here? Uh, someone was asking if you can use Test Kitchen with DSC, Pester, and Hyper-V without using Chef. Yes, absolutely you can. Uh, I forget, I did see a post on that recently that kind of walked you through the steps, but you can absolutely do that. Kitchen is uh, uh, a separate open source project from Chef, and so you can utilize it uh, for other things as well. Uh, but yes, absolutely, that is a use case that's valuable. If you if you don't have any need for Chef and you just want to use it against Pester uh, or just against PowerShell, for example, you can do that uh, as well. Um, another question. Uh, huh? Maybe you can look at the chat. I'm not sure I understand the question from Stinge. Uh, not really related to the session, but since the latest info on nano remembry use case containers, I'm not sure I understand the question. Oh, uh, is that about using Docker containers and whether Chef applies to Docker containers? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, because okay. Nano, yeah, Nano specifically is for containers. Yeah. Uh, so, um, let's see. You, you don't have to use Nano with containers. You can still spin up uh, thing uh, Nano instances without using containers, so there's still a use case there. Uh, but, but often, I, uh, another question that's kind of related is, what about using Chef with Docker and containers? Is there still a use case for that? Uh, and and we're, we're at EBSCO, we're actually thinking about the same things and trying to evaluate is, is Chef still uh, uh, a primary use case for it, when you're using containers in Docker. Uh, and in that case, it, it definitely has less value. Uh, Chef has much more value in, um, you know, long-lived instances or multi-tenant instances where you're not using Docker. So because we're an in internal business systems uh, with, with really – uh, pretty low margins. Uh, we're very cognizant of, of cost and being very efficient with our infrastructure usage. So most of our servers are multi-tenant servers, and so Chef is a great use case there uh, because we want to maintain and manage that configuration for those servers, uh, but we need to do it in a way that's automated. Yeah. As we start to move to containers, that has less value because Docker itself gives you ways to configure uh, the containers, and just generally, the containers are, are they don't live as long, right? They're more ephemeral, uh, where, you know, if, if you think about the, um, the I think the, the, the new example is uh, your fine china versus uh, disposable paper products. Uh, you, you know, you wouldn't uh, really take care, you wouldn't wash or clean or, uh, uh, use disposable plates the same way that you would take care of your fine china. So the the corollary of the metaphor there is you fine china is more like a uh, 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 your long-lived or your multi-tenant instances that you want to keep around for a long time and you do a lot of care and feeding and, and maintenance of those things and you try to keep them healthy uh, versus a docker container that's more like a paper plate where you use it, you get value out of it, and then you get rid of it. And if you if something's wrong with it, if you tear the paper plate, you would just replace it with a new one. If there's something wrong with your container and it's got a bad configuration, you'd probably just dispose of the container and use a new one. Uh, so Chef has less value there, but there's still going to be use cases where 
You might use Chef and cookbooks to manage the Docker host, for example. Uh, and there's always going to be things uh, that we just don't want to use containers for. Uh, it, just, it doesn't make sense, so Chef is still there. So I think Chef will continue to be something in our toolbox. Uh, but as we move more and more to containers, it may be less use, uh, useful in those scenarios. All right, so uh, with that said, we can see that it, it completed. Um, I don't know how far we can go up here, uh, but once it installed the Chef client, uh, then it transferred all of the files uh, from our cookbook, and it started the Chef client run. And so the Chef client looked at, you know, what uh, what uh, what dependencies do you have? And it downloaded all of those cookbooks, and then it started to run those uh, recipes. So it ran the log folder creation resource. It uh, ran the data folder uh, resource. Uh, and then there's others here. It created a website directory, which was one of the resources we didn't look at. Um, it created the website. It ran all of our resources, and then finally, at the end, it gives us some log information that says, hey, I applied uh, four of four resources, and it took about three minutes for the full converge to run. That's installing the Chef client, uploading all of the cookbooks, and then running all of those resources. If I run that converge again, because it's already been applied once, it should run much faster because the Chef client has already run, the cookbooks have already been uploaded, and the resources have all been applied. So we'll rerun this real quick again just to show uh, it's much faster. I think it's somewhere around 20 or 30 seconds the second time. So you can see it's checking the different resources again. It's running all of those test scripts uh, to see if any of the resources need to be reapplied. Um, and then it'll it'll come out and let us know you know what was reapplied and how long did it take. The final step that will oh, there we go. So zero of four resources were applied. It took about 23 seconds uh, because everything had already ran. And then the last step here is to run kitchen uh, verify. And again, we want to target the nano instance. And so now it's going to connect to that virtual machine in Hyper-V and run Pester. Uh, it'll, it'll upload the Pester file and then execute that Pester file and return the results. And you can see that now it, it validated the, the two uh, integration tests that we had to uh, create the data folder and then create the log folder. Uh, we, it passed and had zero failures. If we go back and alter one of our tests to show a failing example, if we make the C logs two and then rerun our test, we'll see one of those uh, integration tests, those pester tests fails because uh, C logs two doesn't exist. It wasn't created, only C logs was. There we go, you get some error information. The first test ran successfully, but the second one, uh, it expected that test path to be true, but it came back false, and it gives you some more further details there. Uh, you can see one passed, uh, three failed. Why does it say three? Let's see. Oh, because we have some inner tests inside of that, so that was that's a nested test uh, for the file share. Uh, so all of that uh, failed as well. If we go back and revert that change, we can go back and see uh, that that passes. So that, that gives you an overview of the different steps uh, for running Kitchen. Uh, let's just real quick add some new functionality. So if, if later I say, okay, I now want to set a registry setting on, on this. Uh, I want to create a, a key of foobar and, and make sure it's set to zero. Uh, so obviously this could be any example where you just have a, a test registry key that we're setting up here, but it's referencing it in the uh, local machine uh, registry and giving it a path and then saying the key name is foobar and the value should be zero. So that's just a, an addition to our pester test. Uh, let's see. So if we re rerun kitchen verify, we should have a new uh, pester test that runs and shows us that we have a new failing test for that registry. So in this case, we are actually performing the testing uh, first. Um, 
uh, did I regret? Let's see. Sixty logs. Oh, uh, I had commented this out earlier because there's it's it's not working right now. So we'll we'll comment that out. The thing that we care about is that should should have registry uh, setting uh, came back false. It expected zero, but it was set to null. So we have a failing test. Uh, two passed, three failed. That's a new failure. But we're, we wrote the test first, right? We wrote that integration test first. So this is what we mean by test-driven development. Uh, the, so the next thing is we, we would look at what would we need to apply to this cookbook uh, to create that registry key. But before we even do that, we want to create a, uh, a unit test uh, to do that. So here we can say um, we can create a unit test to expect the chef run to uh, create a registry key. So remember, this is one of those resource matchers. So uh, this is the registry key resource you, and calling the create action for this path, which is what we saw earlier. And we expect the values to be the key name of foobar, type of D word, and the value of zero. So that's, that's uh, the unit test that we would need to use a chef resource of registry key. But we can also do that with a DSC resource as, as well. And this is just another example of how we would write the unit test for using the DSC resource. So here we have the run D should expect to run DSC resource. Again, this is the resource name. The action is run. Uh, we have a name for that resource and then the various properties uh, for that. Uh, so if we save that and then we go back and we run our spec, now it's going to run with these new unit tests. And so that'll take a second for that to come back. As we're waiting for that, let's go and look at our chef cookbook and see what, what the implementation of that would look like. And comment that. And so here we're just uh, creating those resources like we, we uh, dictated in those unit tests. First, we have a DSC resource of registry key. We're specifying the path of the registry and then setting the values of the key name, the type, and the value, and action of create. And then alternately, we, we will look at a DSC resource that's referencing the registry DSC resource and doing exactly the same thing. So technically, when this runs, we'll see that this will be applied first. And then the, there will be no need to run this one because this one already created it. And we could sw swap these, and, and this one would create it, and this one would be skip. But just for example's sake, uh, we'll, we'll be able to see that. So looking back at our unit test results, you can see we have uh, a couple of failures here. Uh, so uh, we're expecting that the registry key was created, uh, and it, it failed because it, it wasn't created. It couldn't find... Uh, that resource anywhere. That's for the uh, the DSC resource, and then for the registry key chef resource, same thing. It was expected, but we we couldn't find that that uh, that execution anywhere. So now we've created the integration test in our pester file. We've created the unit test in our spec file. Uh, both of those have we've shown that that's failed, and now we'll save our cookbook with these new changes and run kitchen converge on the nano instance. And so now it's going to take these new changes and apply those via the converge step. It's going to apply that to our Hyper-V virtual machine, and we'll see that it creates that registry setting there. So again, this, this should be pretty quick because we're, we're using the pre-existing virtual machine that was already there from our first converge run. So Chef Client is already installed. Uh, all of the other resources have already been applied. It's, going, it's still going to evaluate those to ensure that, uh, and then it'll get down to our registry setting resource. So you can see it says the log folder was up to date, meaning it had already been created. Same thing with data folder and the website directory. All of those are up to date, but then it gets to our registry key resource, and it says, oh, no, no I've got to create that. But then it looks at the DSC add registry key resource, and it says that's up to date because it just applied this one. So that's just two ways of doing the exact same thing, one with a, uh, a, a, a chef resource, one with a DSC resource for registry. So now that that's applied, 
Now we can uh, – oh, I, I neglected to show uh, the chef spec run. So uh, th we should have done this before running the converge step. It would have been successful, but uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and run it now just to show that again. But we'll see that the registry unit tests uh, are passing as well. And then after that, we'll, uh, we'll finish it up with showing that the uh, tester files are running. Uh, let's see. So in this case, oh, I forgot I had a bug in my, uh, let's see. Uh, this needed to be a string. So this is a string. This is just a bug I found earlier. So let's, uh, this is good. We'll, we'll show this, we'll run the unit test again. So we've changed the unit test to say, we want we changed the registry key type from a D word to a string. We'll let that run and we'll come back over here and change these to strings. I'm not gonna save it yet though. So I'm not gonna save that. Uh, this is executing, and now the error should be, um, yep, so we were expecting string, but it was a D word. So this is a unit test. It's failing because the cookbook hasn't been uh, defined in the way that our unit test expected. So now if we come back to the cookbook, we save this value type and rerun our unit tests. This hasn't been applied yet to the, um, uh, to the cookbook. Uh, or to the node, the virtual machine, it's just running in the chef spec sandbox at this point. But we should come back and see that those unit tests are, are passing. So now it's running those, and there's no failures. Everything passed, no failures, so we're good on our unit test. The the cookbook, this cookbook uh, uh, is successful against all those unit tests. Uh, but now if we, um, we still need to converge again because we've changed that type. Uh, so now we'll run converge one last time, and it'll apply this new configuration where it's a string type, not a D word, not a, not a, a digit or a number. So that'll just take a few seconds. So again, it's going through those resources, validating that uh, those have all run successfully. And it's, uh, it should reapply the, um, the registry key because we changed the type. Once that's done, we'll come back and finally uh, rerun the uh, verify, which is gonna run this pester test. There we go. All right, so we can see that the uh, the registry key was reapplied uh, and it converged successfully. And so now, finally, we'll run Kitchen Verify Nano to run our pester tests. And the pester test that was failing around that registry key existing uh, with the appropriate value and type uh, should pass this time. So this is the test-driven approach that we talked about. We validated, uh, let's see, uh, so this is, this is just that, um, this is the log folder, but you can see the should have registry key set uh, was successful. That is not failing, that is succeeding. Uh, I just gotta go back and fix uh, that log share uh, test. So, so we've gone through an example where we, we ran the, sh the kitchen uh, originally to set up the, the stage and, and create kind of a, a development workflow and testing environment. And then once we had that, we went through the process of creating a new configuration, an automated configuration step uh, of setting up a new registry key in a test-driven manner by creating an integration test first, showing that that failed, then creating a unit test, showing that that failed, uh, creating the appropriate resource in the cookbook, rerunning the unit test to show that the unit test passed, then reconverging in kitchen to apply that new cookbook and those changes to the, 
the the VM, and then finally rerunning the tester test to show that that's passing. So that's the the test driven development approach, and and what they call the red green red green approach to develop a test, show the test fails, and then implement the fix to show that the test passes. So just a few more slides and we'll be done. Uh, this slide just, just shows uh, some of the converge times uh, against different uh, uh, VHDs or against different uh, virtual machine platforms. So for 2008R2, that's a much bigger VM. It's a 20 gigabyte VM and it takes about 10 minutes total to go through all of these steps. Once you've done it once, then it takes about 60 to 90 seconds to reconverge and re-verify. So once you've done it once, it's much quicker to uh, reapply that. On Nano, it's a much smaller virtual machine at 600 mega megabytes, uh, and uh, so it, it only has a five-minute total time, and it takes about 30 to 40 seconds. Once you've done it the first time, about 30, 40 seconds to reconverge and re-verify if you're going through that test-driven approach. Uh, we, we've already talked about Pester. It's a great tool and it works well with Kitchen. Uh, we've already gone through the Kitchen demo. These are just some of the versions of the tools that I'm using. Uh, Chef, the Chef DK comes with several uh, Ruby gems that we've leveraged, specifically the Kitchen Hyper-V gem and the Kitchen Pester gem. Uh, those have different versions. You can get the versions of those by running uh, Chef Gem List Kitchen, I think, uh, to get the versions of those. Sometimes it's important to know what version. Uh, all of the code that we looked at today, um, uh, and I believe the slide deck as well, is, is all available on GitHub. And I, I have a bit.ly link for that. It's just on my, my personal repo. But you can go to bit.ly slash TDD Chef uh, to get to that. Uh, let's see if this came back. Yep. So this gives us back the different gym versions. These are always changing and being updated. So occasionally it's it's worth uh, updating those. Uh, and, and the Chef DK as well is, is usually the best way to do that because the Chef DK uh, ensures that Chef has gone through and looking have, has looked at all of the pieces that make up the Chef DK to ensure that Chef and the version of Ruby and the version of Kitchen and the version of all these gyms work together well. Uh, so usually it's a good idea to just upgrade your Chef DK instead of these uh, individual gyms. You can do that, uh, uh, but, but know that you can potentially get into uh, issues with that at times and you might have to work through that. Just a few troubleshooting tips uh, of using with Chef and Kitchen with Windows. Um, if the converge isn't working for, for some reason, you can uh, add in the log uh, verbosity flag of L debug to get more details there. Uh, you, if you're editing gems uh, individually, you might want to verify gem versions. Uh, let's see, cookbooks uh, are always changing. Uh, I, I specifically had an issue with the Windows resource. Uh, whoops. And so if you're relying on Bookshelf to always get latest updates of Windows uh, resource versions, you might need to constrain that. Uh, and so that was one of the things that we saw in this Bookshelf file. Uh, oh, uh, maybe I got rid of it. But you can specify what version specifically you want uh, of that uh, if, if you have issues. Um, sometimes you can have network issues with Hyper-V. Uh, and if you do, you might have to come in here to the virtual switch manager and, and edit some of these settings, delete a virtual, uh, virtual switch and re-add it sometimes. I've just had some issues with that. It, uh, as far as community uh, and getting involved there and, and, and looking for help, uh, two guys specifically that I'll, I'll mention uh, and provide their Twitter handles for, these are the two uh, closest things we have to Chef uh, on Windows experts. Matt Rock and Stephen Morawski are two uh, individuals that are very involved in the Chef community. Matt uh, still works with Chef. Steve uh, worked for Chef up until a couple weeks ago. He works for Microsoft now. Uh, but these guys are very active in the community and, and, and honestly they were the guys that helped me learn this stuff. So if you have questions, I, I will obviously be more than happy to try to help with those, but uh, Matt and Steve are really the, the experts there. And with that, that concludes the demo. Uh, again, you can hit uh, hit me up on Twitter at Chief7. Uh, you can find additional information on .netcatch.com, which is my blog. 
and that's that's really about it. Uh, so we can open up for further questions at this point. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, I didn't see any question. Do you, in the audience, do you have any questions, guys? If something was not clear, or... and also I think I can share the link where you put your code here. Yep. It's just bit.ly slash TDD chef. Uh, so very easy to get to that. All right. Um, I guess there is no questions. It was uh, very, very interesting. Thank you so much, Rob. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, it was really nice. Very good presentation. Thank you.